<sighs> Sorry about um, the odd intro at the beginning of this video. Um, hi, my name's Connor. Um, I recently saw the new James Gray film, Odd Ostra. This has actually been my most anticipated film of the year for quite a while. Pretty much ever since I saw The Lost City of Z a couple of, month, uh, a couple of years back. I was just absolutely blown away at that film. I'm going to have a review of that, I'd say, up in about like a week or so. Um, so just kind of disregard whatever kind of little messages I put at the end of that. Um, this is a review that's going to go up tomorrow uh, because of the weekend rush that's going on with the movie. It's a brand new release. Everybody wants to know what other people's takes are, and et cetera, et cetera. And I figure I might as well get mine out out the gate as soon as possible, uh, see if there's anybody who's interested in what other people's random thoughts are. So I went and saw this after thinking for a while I wasn't going to, but, you know, hey, fate pulls through and let's, you know, like, sometimes things you want to do end up happening anyway, and that's great. And I saw the film, and don't you know don't don't let my initial tone make you think this this film is a disappointment or i didn't like it or any of that kind of stuff i uh, far from it in fact this is a really i would almost kind of say close to being you know um, I, I i'm just kind of gonna get it out of the gate this is a really really well done movie but at the same time, it also kind of reminds me why sometimes watching some of James Gray's films are, you know, they're not they're not the happiest experiences. Like, whatever you saw in the trailers of this kind of looking like some kind of like, you know, like thrilling sci-fi extravaganza, it's not. Like, what Odd Ostra really is about. I'm going to go over a general plot synopsis and what the film is actually about. The film is about an astronaut named Roy McBride, played by Brad Pitt, who goes on a, uh, a journey into the cosmos when his superiors tell him that his father is still alive after a bizarre incident that happens that starts affecting Earth and other planets across the solar system is something called the Surge, where this bizarre wave of energy keeps repeatedly hitting throughout the cosmos and the po more powerful these waves become the more it's going to increasingly danger uh humanity and where the beams are coming from is that they're actually coming around the same point in the solar system where his father went off deep into deep into space around neptune so he's going on so mcbride is going on this expedition to go all the way from here to the moon, to Mars, to all the way to the very edges of the universe to stop these surges from happening. But really, that's just kind of like a surface level thing of what the movie's about. The movie's not really about like any kind of impending disaster that's happening on the planet. It's not about, you know, big, explodey, shooty, action up moments. It's not about that stuff. What the film really is about at its core is that it's a film about a deeply re emotionally repressed man finding himself in a situation where his emotions are coming out over the fact that he's basically been on assigned a mission to find his daddy, who he hasn't seen in well over 30 years. And what follows is a journey that is melancholic, that is methodical, that is at times terrifying. There are some sequences in this movie that are honestly more scarier than some horror films I've seen this year. And I've seen stuff like Us and Midsummer. Um, the stuff that's in this movie is honestly kind of scarier than some of the stuff that, that showed up in those films. That's also it's also beautiful and almost quasi lyrical I, I i'm i'm kind of you know like it was one of those films where after i came out of it i was in this weird state where it's like the after i thought about coming out of the theater i was just like man that was a sad movie like really sad i mean it's it's well paced it's beautifully shot 
it's well directed, well acted, tightly scripted. Uh, it knows exactly what it's A to B to C to D kind of plotting it is. It knows exactly what it wants to be, but if you go into this expecting some kind of grand, glorious spectacle, throw those expectations out the door, because this is not that kind of movie. This is not something that, you know, like, you and a bunch of buddies can go grab a couple of beers with and go see it at the theater. No, this is something that you need to sit down, pay attention to what is going on, and really contemplate in it. Really give it thought. Um, and that... Yeah, I'm I'm sorry, and and don't get me wrong. There is spectacle to be had in the movie. There are some legitimately jaw dropping sequences in it. Uh, the for example, there's like a one of the things one of the places we get to go to is the moon in the movie, and you know we only kind of see brief glimpses of what the moon looks like on there. Um, they had scenes from the trailers where they kind of show that the moon's kind of in a dire place. And they hint at that in the movie, but they don't actually get to fully show it, which kind of sucks. But we get one example of why the moon, even though we've conquered there and there's colonies there, the moon is not a nice place. Not just because of the environment, no. Because there are ruthless space pirates up there that will scavenge, pillage, kill, do whatever the hell they want. As, you know, it's like if you're trying to make it just a simple A to B kind of area... And there's this intense chase where it's like pretty much an entire platoon gets wiped out. Uh, Pitt and another character are only like the survivors afterwards. And it's just like, it's it's a scene that's just like one character gets shot in the face. And I just kind of went, oh God, uh, when that happens. And, and there's other sequences in the movie that are also, you know, as intense and scary as one could picture them to be. And one of the reasons why the movie affected me personally is because of Brad Pitt's tremendous performance. A lot of people are saying this is the movie he should get, like, he, a lot of people are saying that this is his year between this and Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in America. I haven't seen Once Upon a Time in America to make a judgment on that, but based on his performance here, I would, I certainly wouldn't argue against it of him being nominated because this is a fantastic wonderful performance from him it's so nuanced and reserved like you know like for the most part in the movie he's you know like he's a very internalized person he's not somebody who's trying to you know it's like he's he doesn't come off as a emotional person like they constantly do tests on him where his heart rate is always elevated like he's always known for just staying cool under situations but you know, as his own narration in the movie shows, yes, uh, Brad Pitt also narrates the movie too and gives us plenty of internal monologues of what's going through the character's head, which I was a little bit worried about before, you know, like hearing that in some of the earlier reviews, but honestly, when the film actually started playing, I was perfectly okay with it. Like, I was like, you know, people were making it out to be like, it's like it appears every five seconds. No, it, only, it, it appears in the most appropriate moments, basically in the moments where the character is alone where he's where he's just kind of thinking you know like we're we're hearing his thoughts we're hearing the stuff that goes through his head and then you know it's like when when the film you know kind of throws the emotional chips down like he 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 really gives a lot of emotion in some scenes like there's one scene where he discovers some secrets that is just like it, it, it's just a gut punch and or even like another scene that happens towards the end of the third act which is just like you know like it, it just feels like so oh and though his character is well developed and has a you know it's like there's you know like there's something about his character that you know like you gravitate to that also kind of leads me to another problem with the, a problem with the movie is that he's such a well developed character that everyone else around him is just kind of there like it, it really does feel like almost kind of like a minimalist movie where it's like it's so completely focused on his character that pretty much everyone else kind of doesn't matter uh, with the exception of his father of course like those are kind of like the two characters that only really do matter in the movie everyone else is just kind of like oh they're there um but i would say almost kind of like the feelings brad pitt 
Brad Pitt's character expresses towards them actually do make you care. And that's kind of the thing about this movie. If you go into it expecting it to be some kind of, you know, large-scale disaster movie, you know, like blah, 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 that kind of stuff, you're not going to get it. What you're really getting here is that it's a character study in space of a man afraid of meeting his father or, in his own eyes, you know, becoming like him. That's the that's his ultimate fear in the movie. He's not scared of space. He's not scared of the dangers that are hitting Earth. He's not scared of anything else. He's not scared of the pirates. He's not scared of whatever kind of weird things he might discover out in the cosmos. The thing he is most scared about is becoming his father. And that's unique for a science fiction movie that it kind of like throws, you know, it's like, it, it almost kind of feels like the kind of, you know, typical stuff that'd be, you know, like the stuff to pull people in is the window dressing really for the stuff that actually matters. And I don't think people are going to fully respond to that. I could kind of tell that my audience after I saw it was kind of grumpy with the movie. Like nobody seemed to be really into it after it ended. Whereas, you know, me, I was like, wow, that was really good. And then after I count, oh, oh man, Oh, now I'm thinking about it. That's just sad. Um, and I don't want to sound like, you know, because the supporting players, because they don't have much, you know, like to work with in comparison to Pitt are bad because there's quite a bit of good, you know, like actors in this that, you know, do a good job. You know, like you got uh, Donald Sutherland, Ruth Nega. Uh, there's also Tommy Lee Jones, who I would say like 90% of this movie is the Brad Pitt show. 5% is, uh, 10% is Tom, no, no, 85% of this movie is pretty much the Brad Pitt show, 10% is Tommy Lee Jones, and the last five is, like, some of the other characters, um, I know some people have kind of taken issue with, like, say, for example, Liv Tyler's character, who only appears in flashbacks and kind of doesn't get much dialogue, especially in comparison to the trailers, which, um, oh, oh, well, you know, oh, oops, a little charge situation, let me fix that, do, 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 do. what, I thought, oh, crap, that's what the problem was, hang on, there we go, okay, that's better, sorry about that, um, she doesn't get much in the movie, we only kind of see her character in flashbacks, and it's implied that she left him because he was starting to become his father, you know, kind of being so obsessed with work that he wasn't really paying attention to what really matters is the people around you. And that's another message about the movie is that it's, you know, like, it, it, it's also a film about loneliness and that, you know, how bad loneliness can be, but sometimes you can find hope in being alone. Like, it's it's not always a bad thing um it, it it's especially cemented at, at the end of the movie i won't say how but it does tie into the film's final third act um i almost kind of feel like i should go over some of the nice some of the other things about the movie that are a little less depressing than the thematic stuff but um for one thing this is a fantastic looking movie i don't think i'm going to come across a better show better shot looking or better looking movie this year. Uh, it was shot by Hoyt Van Hoytema, uh, who did the cinematography for a couple of Christopher Nolan's movies like Interstellar and Dunkirk. Uh, yeah, so, hmm. um, but uh, he shot it with 35 millimeter, which is Gray's preference. He always wants to shoot on film and the results are stunning. Like, you know, there are some scenes where you can really see the grain and it looks fantastic. A lot of the shot composition, there's a lot of really just like exquisite use of like, you know, terrific physical sets um, and the way the movie plays with lighting, like how there's like, you know, scenes on Mars where it's not just orange, but it's like sometimes it's just completely bathed in red. And then there's this other scene where Brad Pitt looks like he's like swimming through, I couldn't tell if it was fuel or water or something, like he's like holding on to a rope. And you see, like, the little particles coming down, the sun piercing through. And it's just, it's so gorgeous. And you're seeing, like, the, ref you know, like, his his head and the helmet. Or even towards the end, some of the color choices they do uh, when we finally reach our destination. Where it's, like, it's, like, everything's bathed in this gorgeous, like, deep blue that's, like, you know, like, it just, it, it feels like a completely different environment. Um... 
And there's a lot of great close-ups in the movie, great shots of just kind of like Pitt's eyes or, you know, like just the stuff he does with his face. Like, you know, he, you know, like he, he, he doesn't do much, you know, like emotional acting in the movie, but you can tell what's going through his headspace. You can tell what's going through his emotions, what he's thinking, what he's feeling, how much he's like in the state of like, what am I going to do when I get up there? What, what's, what, what, what am I going to do? Um... And then, of course, there's Max Richter's score, which is really nice. From what I understand, there were some additional com compositions from the guy who did the music for stuff like, of all things, Mission Impossible Fallout, Lego Batman. Um, I couldn't tell which was which, but a lot of it did sound like Richter's. And, you know, like, there are some really, you know, like, intense uses of music in the movie. And the pacing is fantastic. This is a lean, focused two hours. Like, it zips by quick. As I said, I do have issues with the movie. I do think that, you know, like, we could have had more scenes of world building. We could have had more scenes of character development. I honestly, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to a longer cut of this movie. Um, I would say, you know, like, it, it's kind of weird that, you know, like, this and It Chapter 2 come out in the same month, and I'd figure both movies would have the opposite runtimes. So I figured Ad Astra would be the movie that'd be almost close to three hours and it would and it chapter two would be the one around two or so but no it's the other way around we're living in topsy-turvy world lately what the hell but despite my my qualms within in a, in a couple of ways mainly in regards to the characters and world building there is a lot to admire what this movie is doing and i can see it being one of those films that gets better with repeated viewings I've seen all of James Gray's films, and I can say without a doubt, he's probably one of our best filmmakers. Um, if I were to rate this on, like, you know, like his, what I'd consider to be his best, you know, like best to worst movies, though, quite frankly, all his movies are good. This is kind of like, I would actually put this, uh, like, I would say uh, Lost City is He, The Yards, Two Lovers, The Immigrant, Odd Ostro, We on the Night, Little Odessa, but all those are really good movies, so it kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, this, this did pretty much live up to my expectations. Not fully, not completely. This wasn't, you know, like, after you make a movie like The Lost City of Z, like, it's just kind of like, you know, there's no way you're going to be able to top something like this for a while. This, that is, that is legitimately one of the best movies I've ever seen, uh, Lost City of Z was. But this is, this is still really, really fantastic stuff. And, and it does work as a companion piece, too. Perhaps not as textured, but there is a lot to admire here, and there is a lot of things Gray does well in the movie. Um, I don't see this doing well at the box office, because I've been kind of like seeing some audience reactions to it. Some people are not liking this at all, kind of thinking it's mopey and pretentious. I can agree with maybe the mopey comments, because this is a sad movie. I was, you know, I was kind of, mm, after it was over, but I don't think it's pretentious, because... It is a movie with genuine things to say. It knows exactly what it's doing. It knows exactly the things it wants to say. Maybe the execution might not be for everybody, but it certainly was for me. Um, so yeah, Odd Ostra. Really sad, but really goddamn good. I, I, I can definitely recommend it without hesitation. Um, just, you know, be warned. You, you might kind of feel like uh, somebody might be cutting a bowl of onions right next to you as you watch it. I didn't feel like that as I was watching it, but after I came out of the theater, I certainly felt that way. I was like, oh man, why do I feel kind of sad? Mm. Okay, um, also one last thing before I got off. Um, I got a couple of trailers in front of this, uh, two Fox-related movies. I got Ford vs. Ferrari and Underwater. Uh, Ford vs. Ferrari looks like fun. Looks like a good, you know, like straightforward biopic probably is James Mangle, the guy who did Logan and Walk the Line and Identity and a whole slew of other good movies. So uh, I've been hearing early, early word of mouth that the racing sequences in are killer and they certainly look it. Uh, and then there was something for some kind of alien knockoff that's called Underwater with Kirsten Stewart. And yeah, that might be fun though. The PG-13 rating kind of throws me off because it's like, look, it's an alien knockoff. Go all the way with it and make it R-rated. Yeah. But anyway... Yeah, definitely check out Odd Ostra if you can. Um, I saw it in a regular theater, but from people's impressions I've been hearing, it's definitely a film also worth pursuing in a large format. And I, I'd love to see what this looks like in like something like IMAX or uh, 
Dolby Cinema or any of those kind of formats. Anyway, all of you have a good day and um, check my links down below to my Twitter and Letterboxd and all that wonderful stuff. Anyway, you have a good one.